Grace and peace in the name of God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am Pastor Aaron Gurner, and I'd like to welcome you to our class on Systematic Theology. And the title of our text is instructive, Everyone's a Theologian. And we've learned that while everyone's a theologian, not everyone is a good theologian. Everyone is a theologian means that everyone thinks about God, life, and the world that he made. But not everyone thinks rightly about God. And the goal of this course is to help you become a good theologian to the glory of God so you can help others also think rightly about God. In today's lecture, we will be continuing our study of R.C. Sproul's book, Everyone's a Theologian, and we'll be looking at chapters 7 and 8. Chapter 7, we'll be looking at the canonicity of Scripture, and in chapter 8, we'll be looking at Scripture and Authority. Before we begin, I would encourage you to pause watching and spend time in prayer. And I'd encourage you to use Titus chapter 2 and pray that from the verses 7 and 8, that you, by God's grace, would show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching that you would show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. And after you're done praying, I'll still be here. Percy Sproul begins chapter 7 saying, The word Bible comes from the Greek word biblos, which means book. However, although the Bible is bound up in one volume, it is not a single book, but rather a collection of 66 individual books. It is a library of books. Since there are so many books that together make up the sacred scriptures, how do we know that the right books have been included in this collection or library of books? That question falls under the issue of canonicity. What is canonicity? Canonicity comes from the word canon and means rule. It is a standard of measurement. Every society establishes standardized measurements. There are agreed upon standards for length, mass, time, temperature, electric current, and so on. In marketplaces, for instance, scales are used to ensure fair transactions. The importance of accurate and honest measurements is highlighted in Proverbs chapter 11, where Solomon says, A false balance is an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. This verse underscores that Dishonest scales are detested by the Lord as they equate to forms of lying and stealing. Just as societies rely on established standards for measurement, the Bible serves as a foundational standard or benchmark reflecting God's special revelation. The matter of canon is important because God's word dictates the principles for both our present life and the hereafter. To use the wrong standard has consequences for this life and eternal life. In 1999, NASA, America's space agency, lost the Mars Climate Orbiter spacecraft because one engineering team used metric units, they used meters and kilograms, while another used English units, feet and pounds, for a key space, spacecraft operation. This mistake caused the Mars Climate Orbiter to disintegrate, and the space agency lost $125 million and countless hours of human effort and dedication. You see, the right canon, the right books of the Bible, God's special revelation, are crucial because using the wrong standard, using the wrong books, has consequences not only for this life, but for all eternity. Think of Moses' words to God's people in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 47. For it is no empty word for you, but your very life, and by this word you shall live long in the land. In the last chapter of the Bible, the Apostle John testified in Revelation chapter 22 and verses 18 and 19. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book 
if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. I believe what John wrote in the book of Revelation applies to the rest of scripture. Proverbs 30 and verses 5 and 6 says, Every word of God proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. In the Protestant Bible, or in the Protestant canon, there are a total of 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, and 27 in the New Testament. That there is a canon or rule is also mentioned in the Westminster Standards, in the Shorter Catechism, in question two. The question is asked, what rule meaning what standard has God given to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him? And the answer is the word of God, which is contained in the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, is the only rule to direct us how we may glorify and enjoy him. And the rule or the canon of books are also listed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. So let's take a look very briefly at the Westminster Confession of Faith as it lists the 66 books of the Bible. In chapter 1, paragraph 2 of the Westminster Confession of Faith, the 39 books of the Old Testament are listed, beginning with the first five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the rest of the books are going all the way through the last books of the Old Testament, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And the Westminster Confession goes on to list the 27 books of the New Testament, beginning with the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then it goes on to conclude with the Revelation of John, saying, all which, so there's a total of 66 books, all which are given by inspiration of God to be the rule, there's that word for canon again, to be the rule, that that standard of faith and life. Now, not everyone is a good theologian, and therefore not everyone agrees on the canon or the books of Scripture. During Jesus' time, for example, the Samaritans recognized only the first five books of the Bible. The Mormons add another scripture called the Book of Mormon. Muslims reject both the Old and New Testament scriptures with, and they replace them with the, the Quran. And to better understand the concept of canonicity, I'd like to look at a book that is not a part of the Christian canon, the Gospel of Barnabas. Now, as we look at the Gospel of Barnabas, it's important to understand that you you might be looking and saying, wait a minute, there are only four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. However, some Muslims believe that the Gospel of Barnabas is the most authentic Gospel, and some Muslims criticize Christians for not including the Gospel of Barnabas as part of our New Testament canon. In fact, I've received emails from Muslims saying things like, and this is a Muslim writing to me, I have already read the Bible and the one that's forbidden to be read, Barnabas. Read it and see the difference. May God guide you to the truth. Another Muslim wrote to me, The Gospel of Barnabas was accepted as a canonical gospel in the churches of Alexandria until 325 AD. In 383 AD, the Pope secured a copy of the Gospel in his private library. The same Gospel of Barnabas and its translations are in circulation today. Please don't deny historical facts. And elsewhere, someone has written to me, 
The Gospel of Barnabas is the only eyewitness account of the life and mission of Jesus. Read the Gospel of Barnabas, and you will really know the facts about Jesus and the Quran, respectively. Now, the Gospel of Barnabas claims to be a biography of Jesus Christ written by a man named Barnabas, who claimed to be a follower of Jesus. And the Gospel of Barnabas is a combination of stories. You will find some of these stories in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But you'll also find in the Gospel of Barnabas the Islamic view of Jesus. And the Gospel of Barnabas discusses things like Jesus' birth, his ministry. It mention, uh, The Gospel of Barnabas has Jesus mentioning Muhammad nine times. The Gospel of Barnabas says Abraham offered Ishmael as a sacrifice and not Isaac. And it even has Jesus rejecting his deity and death on the cross. The Gospel of Barnabas says that Judas was made to look like Jesus and was crucified in his place. The Gospel of Barnabas says the Apostle Paul was deceived by Satan. And so you might be thinking to yourself, as we think about the importance of the rule and the, the canon of Scripture, why isn't the Gospel of Barnabas in the Bible? Why isn't it part of the list of books? Why isn't it a part of the canon? Are Christians, was the Pope, trying to hide something by keeping it out of the Bible? Well, as it turns out, the Gospel of Barnabas was written sometime in the 16th century A.D., Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written sometime in the first century AD, the same century of Jesus' public ministry, but the Gospel of Barnabas was written about 1,500 years later. The Gospel of Barnabas, you see, was never part of the Christian canon. But for many Muslims, the Gospel of Barnabas is the first and only Gospel some Muslims ever read. I would, and I would say, if you have a Muslim friend or acquaintances, invite them to read the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and learn more about the true and historical Jesus. Gently remind them that Christians did not leave out a true Gospel, but some Muslims have tried to corrupt the Bible by adding to the Word of God. When it comes to canon, the rule and list of New Testament books of the Bible, the Gospel of Barnabas, isn't the only book, of course, that claims to be a biography of Jesus. There are many others. There are books like the Gospel of Thomas, uh, the Sayings and the Acts of Peter, the Gospel of Philip, the Sophia of Jesus Christ. There's the Gnostic Apocalypse of Peter, the Gospel of Judas. And again, why weren't these books included in the canon, the list of books in the New Testament? For the same kinds of reasons that the Gospel of Barnabas wasn't. These books were written at a later date. From the very beginning of the church, the basic books of the New Testament, those that we read and observe today, were in use, and they functioned as a canon because of their apostolic authority. Sproul writes that the issue that provoked the establishment of the canon was the appearance of a heretic named Marcion who issued his own canon. Under the influence of Gnosticism, which is bad theology, Marcion believed that the God portrayed in the Old Testament is not the ultimate God of the universe, but rather a lesser deity called a demiurge who has a nasty disposition, and that Christ came to reveal the true God and to deliver us from this mean-spirited deity. As a result, Marcion expurgated everything in the New Testament that could link Christ in a positive way to Yahweh, the God of the Old Testament. Sproul goes on to say, the Gospel of Matthew and much material from the other Gospels were cut out by Marcion, as was any reference that Christ made to God as his Father. Marcion also eliminated, eliminated some of Paul's writings. He ended up producing a small, abridged, and edited version of the New Testament. This heresy, this bad theology, spurred the church 
to give an authoritative formal list of actual biblical books. So Marcion, who lived in about the year 85 AD to about 160 AD, Marcion was a heretic. And teachers and pastors in the church should be good theologians. But again, Marcion was so bad that he began adding and subtracting to the scriptures. And Marcion was so bad that his own father excommunicated him. As Sproul wrote, one of Marcion's bad theologies was his belief in teaching that the God of the Old Testament is different from the God of the New Testament. And this is what led Marcion to reject most of the Old Testament, which we learned in our last lecture, the Old Testament were Jesus' scriptures. Jesus accepted the Old Testament scriptures. And not only did Marcion reject the Old Testament, but much of the New Testament. And this is why Marcion was then excommunicated. Dr. Michael Kruger has done a lot of writing on the New Testament canon. In fact, it's an entire study by itself. And I'd like to show you a short clip, clip of Dr. Kruger explaining why other books weren't included in the New Testament canon. One of the questions I get a lot from people and that I think are on people's minds is this question of how do I know the, the Bible I'm reading is not missing books? How do I know we have the right books in our Bibles? And a lot of my work has been particularly on the side of the New Testament half of that. And people ask all the time, what about books like the Gospel of Thomas? And what about these other uh, lost uh, books in the Bible that we hear about from time to time in the media and archeological discoveries? Those are really important questions and Christians wanna be reassured that the books in their Bibles are the ones they can trust and really rely on. The good news is we have great reasons to trust that we have the right books in our Bibles. One of the things I remind people when it comes to the compilation of our Bibles, particularly the New Testament, is how early it happened. Um, we didn't have to wait till the fourth or fifth century to have a New Testament. Even as early as the second century, Christians already had coalesced around a core collection of books that were very clearly the ones they viewed as coming from God. People will say, and you'll hear in the world out there, that there was no Bible till the fourth or fifth century and that Christians didn't have a New Testament until then either. And that's simply not the case. In the early church, we know that they had a Bible very early because they had an Old Testament from the start and they had a New Testament even by the second century. The other thing I tell people to assure them about the, the books they have in the New Testaments is that we can trace those books back to the first century. Uh, and therefore we can trace those books back to the time of the apostles. Uh, in fact, it's only the New Testament books uh, when we talk about books in early Christianity uh, and compare them to apocryphal books that come from the first century. We have a few books like First Clement that barely make it into the first century, but all the New Testament books are first century books. And that should give us great assurance that that was written during the apostolic time period and those are the books that we can trust. So in the end, uh, I tell people, look, you can have great confidence that when you open up that table of contents, that these are the books that God laid down as a deposit for his church. And for generations, it's that church, the universal church that's recognized that these are the books that we hear the voice of Christ in. In the video clip you just watched, Dr. Kruger points out an important point about the New Testament canon. All 27 books of the New Testament were written in the first century during the time of the apostles. Other books that claim to be gospels were written after the first century and after the time of the apostles Jesus chose. Remember, the Gospel of Barnabas was written 1,500 years later. Now, this is just an introduction to systematic theology, but you can find, and I've included uh, the link where you can go to, you can find an entire course at Ligonier Ministries taught by Dr. Kruger on this important and fascinating subject. As for the books of the Old Testament, Sproul discusses differences between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. Sproul writes, A dispute arose in the 16th century between the Roman Catholic Church and Protestants 
over the scope and extent of the Old Testament scriptures, specifically over the Apocrypha, a group of books produced during the intertestamental period. The Roman Catholic Church embraced the Apocrypha. The Reformation churches, for the most part, did not. So, as I have already pointed out, Protestants have in their Old Testament 39 books, whereas the Roman Catholics have 46 books in their Old Testament. The seven additional books are sometimes called deuterocanonical. And these, are, these books are Tobit, Judith, the Wisdom of Solomon, Ecclesiasticus, or sometimes called Sirach, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, and Baruch. Reasons these books are not part of the Protestant canon, reason they're not included in the Protestant Old Testament, is that they were not accepted as canon and equally authoritative until after the Protestant Reformation and the time of the Council of Trent in the 16th century. A second reason is that it appears these books weren't part of the Jewish canon of Scripture in Jesus' day. There were various Jewish sects in Jesus' day, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, and Jesus interacted with their differences. However, it appears that none of these sects disagreed about what was Scripture. And to my knowledge, none of them accepted these seven apocryphal books on the same level as the other Old Testament books. In fact, there was a first century Jewish scholar and historian named Josephus. Josephus was born in Jerusalem to a father of priestly descent and a mother who claimed royal Davidic ancestry. Josephus wrote about what we call the deuterocanonical or the apocryphal books. And he wrote, From Artaxerxes to our own times, a complete history has been written, but has not been deemed worthy of equal credit with the earlier records because of the failure of the exact succession of the prophets. This statement indicates Josephus knew of other books like Tobit and Judith and Maccabees, but he and other Jews did not consider them equal to the Old Testament scriptures. The Apostle Paul says in Romans 3 and verse 2 that the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. And since it appears the Jews did not receive these additional books, Protestants have not included them as the oracles of God. We don't include them in our canon. Now, another reason most Protestants don't accept the apocryphal books as equal with the other 39 books of the Old Testament scriptures is because the Apocrypha contains errors. Now, last time we learned that the scriptures are inerrant, but the Apocryphal books contain errors. An example is found in the book of Judith. According to the Anchor Bible Dictionary, the most flagrant errors, referring to those errors found in the book of Judith, come from the first verse. It was in the twelfth year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar who ruled over the Assyrians from his capital, Nineveh. Because as most students of the Bible know, Nebuchadnezzar was king of Babylon, not Assyria, and Nineveh was destroyed in 612 BC. That is several years before Nebuchadnezzar came to the throne. Finally, the twelfth year of Nebuchadnezzar would have been the fourth year of the reign of Zedekiah, Judah's last king in the pre-exilic period. Yet elsewhere in Judith, the story is set in the post-exilic period. These are but the story's most egregious historical blunders. Because of these and other errors, and because the Jews did not accept the apocryphal books as holy scripture, most Protestants have not. Now, just because these books aren't part of the canon does not mean they are worthless. These are still extremely valuable books. They're just not holy scripture. In fact, R.C. Sproul wrote in one of his many books, he wrote that the Protestant reformers, while declaring that the apocryphal books were not inspired as God's revelation, still maintained their value as literature. 
they provide the closest view we have of the period between Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, and John the Baptist. Many reformers believe that apart from the scripture, the Apocrypha contains our most important body of literature. Now, the Apocrypha has some excellent teaching and provides invaluable insight for the time period between Malachi and John the Baptist. While the Apocrypha has historically been read by Protestants for edification, it has not been accepted for establishing doctrine. As Sproul came to conclude chapter 7, he mentioned briefly that the church was guided by God's providence in her determination of what books were to be part of the church's canon. He writes, according to the Protestants, each book found in the Bible is an infallible book, but the process undertaken by the church as to which books to include was not infallible. We believe that the church was providentially guided by the mercy of God in the process of determining the canon and thereby made the right decisions so that every book that should be in the Bible is in the Bible. However, we do not believe that the church was inherently infallible then or now. By contrast, the Roman Catholic formula says that we have the correct books because the church is infallible and anything the church decides is an infallible decision. In the Roman Catholic understanding, the formation of the canon rests on the authority of the church, whereas in the Protestant understanding, it rests upon the providence of God. In the last paragraph of this chapter, Sproul commends further study of the development of the canon. And the the person I've found most helpful on this issue, as we've already looked at, is Dr. Michael Kruger. And I'd like to show you another video clip from Dr. Kruger and the difference between the Reformed Protestant and the Roman Catholic view of canon. And Kruger uses the illustration of the thermometer and the thermostat. When I say the church is a reliable guide to canonicity, we're not saying that because we think the church is infallible. We're not saying that because we think the church creates the canon or constitutes the canon. No, not at all. We're saying that simply because we think the church with the spirit in it is going to reliably react to what God is doing in these books. It's going to respond to what God has already done. Sort of as an analogy of this, I think is really helpful, uh, is the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. Okay? The difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. The difference between those two things really captures the difference between the Protestant view of the church and the Roman Catholic view of the church. See, the Roman Catholic view of the church is that it creates the canon. It makes the canon what it is. The Protestant view of the church is, no, the church simply responds to the canon. It responds to what's already there, right? And it reliably responds because of the Spirit's help, so we can look to the church as a guide, but it doesn't create the canon. And a thermostat and thermometer are the same same idea. Let's imagine you're in your house and you go into the hallway and you look at that little box on the wall, right? It's got two numbers on it. One is a thermometer. That tells you what the temperature actually is. And then one's a thermostat. That's what you want the temperature to be, right? Think about the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer simply responds or reacts to the temperature in the room. A a thermostat, in contrast, tries to control and create and cause the temperature in the room, right? One responds to temperature, one causes temperature. That is the difference between our view of the canon and the Roman Catholic view of the canon. Our view of the canon is that the church merely reacts to what is already objectively there, just like a thermometer responds to temperature. It's reliable. I can look at a thermometer and I can tell me what temperature is in the room. Why? Because the thermometer created the temperature? No, it just reacts to it. It's exactly what we're arguing here. Why is it that the consensus of the church is a reliable guide? Because God's at work in her. In the video clip you just watched, Dr. Kruger uses the illustration of the thermometer and a thermostat. Now, as you're looking at the picture, On the left-hand side is a thermostat. A thermostat controls temperature. This would be the Roman Catholic view of the canon. And the right picture is a thermometer which tells what the temperature is. This is the Protestant, the Reformed Protestant understanding of the canon. Telling what the temperature. We hear, in other words, we hear Jesus' voice 
through the Holy Spirit who inspired Scripture. Now I'd like to move on to chapter 8. This short chapter deals with the Scripture being the ultimate authority. The Scripture isn't the only authority, but is the ultimate and final authority. Sproul discusses one of the differences between Roman Catholicism and Protestantism going back to the 16th century Roman Catholic Council of Trent. At this council, and in subsequent years, Roman Catholicism made clear that they appealed to tradition and the Bible as a final authority. Sproul writes, so the Roman Catholic Church appeals to both the tradition of the church and the Bible for its doctrine, which is what makes ecumenical dialogue very difficult. When a particular doctrine falls under scrutiny, Protestants want to establish their position strictly on the authority of the Bible, whereas Rome wants to include the renderings of church councils or papal encyclicals. We see this with issues such as the Immaculate Conception of Mary. That's the Roman Catholic dogma that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was free from original sin from the moment of her conception. Now, although no such doctrine is found anywhere in the scriptures, Roman Catholics establish the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception of Mary on the basis of tradition. Now, the Immaculate Conception of Mary, again, which is not to be confused with the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the Immaculate Conception of Mary is not found in the Bible. It's a dogma that is an addition to what is revealed in the Bible. It's kind of like someone were to add a verse to the Bible. The Bible says we are not to add or subtract from God's Word. Roman Catholicism, though, adds dogmas that are equally authoritative as the doctrine found in the Bible. Sproul writes, The Reformers restricted binding authority to the Scriptures because they were convinced that the Scriptures are the Word of God and that God alone can bind the conscience and has absolute authority. It's important to remember that while Protestant Reformed Protestants reject Rome's claim to an equal, infallible authority with the Bible, Protestants, Reformed Protestants, don't reject authority. We don't reject the work of the Holy Spirit and the centuries-long history of the Church. Rather, binding authority or supreme authority is found in the Scripture alone. Sometimes you'll hear the Latin phrase, sola scriptura. We should not add dogmas or doctrines on the same level as Holy Scripture. The Westminster Confession of Faith, which we looked at earlier, this is a Reformed uh, Confession drafted in 1646 by the Westminster Assembly as part of the Westminster Standards. It is regarded as one of the most biblically sound and concise theological statements ever written in the Christian tradition. But it's always subordinate to the Scripture. It is not on the same equal level as Scripture. Now, the Confession says of Scripture's authority, the supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined, and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Spirit speaking in the Scripture. Reformed Protestants don't reject the work of the Holy Spirit and the centuries-long history of the Church. And Sproul goes on to write, The Church is always subordinate to the authority of the Bible. This does not mean that the church has no authority. State governments and parents have authority, but those authorities have been delegated by God. They do not have the absolute authority that goes with God's own word. So any authority held by the church is subordinate 
to the authority of Scripture. And lastly, R.C. Sproul reminds us of the importance of studying the Bible. In all our study of the doctrine of Scripture, don't forget to read the Bible. The Bible is the source of our theology. Sproul writes, The crisis in our day is not simply over the issue of whether the Bible is infallible, inerrant, or inspired. The crisis is over the content of the Bible. Do you know what is in the Bible? This volume on systematic theology is ambitious in that it covers many issues, yet far more important than studying systematic theology is that the people of God come to a knowledge of the content of Scripture. This means you should not let systematic theology ever become a substitute for reading and studying and enjoying the Bible. Have you read the Bible? Is the Bible the book you read, study, and meditate and love? In summary, we have looked at how the Bible is a collection of 66 books, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. These 66 books make up the canon, meaning the rule and standard of God's special revelation, and we are not to add or subtract from God's Word. We learned about the bad theologian Marcion and how his rejection of the Old Testament and much of the New Testament prompted the church to list the books accepted in the church. We looked at the Gospel of Barnabas and why it was never part of the Christian scriptures, but how it has led countless Muslims astray from Jesus and from reading the true Gospels. We spent time looking at the other ancient books known as the Apocrypha and why these books are not part of our Old Testament. And finally, we learned that a good theologian never allows theology, or I should say theology books, to become a substitute for reading and studying and enjoying the Bible. So, as we conclude looking at all of these things, I want to, again, emphasize the the importance of being a good theologian and as a good theologian, learning to enjoy the Bible, which is the source of all good theology. Next time, Lord willing, we will be looking at chapter 9 and the knowledge of God. And until then, enjoy the reading and your study of the scriptures and systematic theology, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you.